G'day. My name's Noel Danup, and I have an ancestral connection to this river through my father's side, which is Nyunga. Hello, my name's Steve Hopper. I was lucky enough to land a job as the state's first flora conservation research officer in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. And uh, the more I looked at flora, the more I looked at country, the more I became interested in how do we care for this place and chart a way to live sustainably with it, it's, it's just bleeding obvious. If, a, if people have been here for 50,000 years and we've inherited what they've, they've gifted to us, then surely there are things we can learn as a, as a society from Noongar people. When we talk about language, for us as Aboriginal people, it's when we actually speak our mother tongue in our homeland, that's when the vibration breaks into the spirit world. And as that vibration breaks into the spirit world, that spirit will come to us. As it comes to us, it'll be with us and it'll guide us through our day. And it'll present us with situations where we see the spirit at work. And then that helps us. And in a situation like this, we'll be following in the footsteps of our ancestors. And basically by walking together, I think it's a much uh, more powerful way to understand country and learn from each other than travelling separate paths. So the river itself is, it, to me, um, of common interest across all cultures. And uh, this exercise, I think, is really about exploring how we can learn from each other as we travel down from this place uh, into the heart of a a modern city and realise there's a, there's a deep history there, culturally, geologically, biologically. So that's what this is all about to me. It's about learning, so therefore it's education. And as one of my work colleagues said as we sat down and we talked about the ancient way is, there's a lot of synergies in this. So hence the synergy of the Aboriginal world um, based on, if you like, large doses of common sense. And then here we are with this uh, modern world based on large doses of scientific principle and knowledge. Kura knitting. A long time ago, the world was cold, dark, and desolate. 300 million years ago, the planet was witness to the Permian Ice Age. Australia was part of a supercontinent called Gondwana. The sky was so heavy, it crushed the land flat and featureless. The Wagal, the rainbow serpent, a vast force moved under the earth and across the land, forming ridges 
and rivers. So when you look at a piece of country like this, from a Nyungar perspective, as you're looking at it, you can actually see where in our stories, the great Wagal moved across the land. And as it did, the way we look at the world, it created valleys like this wherever it went and pushed up hills on either side of it. This is a, a really unusual place for Southwestern Australia. We, <clears throat> we sit here on the edge of what's called the Yilgarn Block, which is a massive area of, of granite rock that runs from here, this, this is right on the western margin, over to the other side of Kalgoorlie into the goldfields and uh, right up north into the Murchison River area, down almost to the south coast. But the Swan Coastal Plain itself is where uh, uh, Greater India, including Tibet, and uh, the Western Australian part of it, the Australian plate, ripped apart as Gondwana, the great southern continent, uh, started to separate about 150 million years ago. Uh, to me, it's, it's just this tremendous marker in the landscape between the great rift valley of the Swan Coastal Plain uh, with that massive sand uh, and this ancient nucleus of earth that has been here for so long, it's essentially timeless. How do we know these rocks are half the age of the earth itself? The earth is 4.6 billion years old. These are about two and a half billion years. Uh, you have to focus on, on uh, certain elements and their radioactive forms to get the clock that gives you that answer. I know in Noongar culture, some people say, well, we've just been here forever. And it, it, it's um, uh, from the perspective of your lifetime and mine, that's absolutely right. As we look at this and we bring into it the concept of time, for us as Aboriginal people, time means very little because it's either daytime or nighttime. Of course, you've got your, your six season cycle, which take you through where you are in different places in your Kalap Gur, your home country. And traveling through here would have been part of that. So we were able to do that and live in complete isolation from the rest of the world, untainted by any other culture for many thousands of years. The spirit birds built platforms to hold up the sky. The spirit ancestors of flora and fauna find their place on Earth. 250 million years ago, the glaciers melt, leaving strange rock clusters and evolutionary ancestors of flora, fauna and mammals appear. Flora and fauna of the southwest, the more it's looked at and investigated, the more special and unusual it is. Um, it's incredibly rich in species, uh, especially in plants and, and a number of the, uh, the smaller groups of animals. Uh, with plants, half the plants you see here are found nowhere else on the planet. When we think about what might have been here a long, long time ago, um, particularly in relation to um, fauna, there was of course a time when there were very, very large animals. And the myths and the stories are still shared and talked about. And in particular in this area here was a giant kangaroo. And um, of course, uh, that's called Yonga. And then in particular, this big lizard. It was a huge lizard. And it was a go and we called it Kada. And um, I understand that that uh, that one in particular is called Megalania. The megafauna goes back um, 40, 50 million years. And every continent has it, Africa still has it. Um, but uh, most of the other uh, continents, um, uh, the megafauna is extinct. 
largely. The kangaroo, I guess, would be the biggest animal we still have, the onga. Um, but the fossil record is there. And Australia, again, is so different from the other continents. So when we talk about the importance of flora and fauna to us as Aboriginal people, particularly here in Noongar country, they're all part of the story and that's what connects you to country. And they're um, part of the totemic system. They're part of you, you're part of them. The spirit woman, Jindalee, puts the spirit children in her hair and jumps into the sky. And her hair became the cosmos, the Milky Way. The spirit woman needed to atone. She gives the gift of a rainbow, but she cannot reach the earth. containing a reflection of the rainbow falls to earth. The colour fills the earth. It sees the establishment of a warmer climate. Hence the flowers and birds become more colourful and mammals gain the capacity to see colour. We are in a, in a place here, particularly on the west coast, that is Mediterranean in climate, that's a borrowed European concept, but Yep. Winter wet, summer dry is, is what happens. And we have a lot of uh, evidence that rainfall is changing. You know, when we talk about rain, for us, it's um, the crying rain. So we call it Ngayini Borong Kep, the crying rain. And um, as it falls, of course, uh, it brings all the colour and we see that in the flowers and everything as they grow, as well as the beautiful rainbows, Wolgawa, Wolgan. And um, of course, rain nurtures and cleanses, um, nurtures everything and cleanses everything, even cleanses our thoughts and gives us the opportunity to realise that, um, you know, there's this beautiful place and it, and it absolutely needs, needs rain. For us as Aboriginal people, we're born in a catchment. And where the rain falls and the water flows, so does our spirit. And as we're born in that situation, that rain falls, the water flows, then that's our home country. That river knows us. And everything begins its life journey in water. So that's the baseline. And then we can only grow from there. I think that applies across all cultures. Uh, water is life. About 200,000 years ago, modern humans evolve and move eastwards, crossing into the continent, Australia. Human spirit ancestors become real, having all the qualities and vulnerabilities of modern humans. It is not a separation from the spirit world, but a continuation of the cycle of birth, life, death and spirit. Okay, so things you should be looking for now as a synergy is what's still happening here in this, this part of the world, you know? There's still this wind blowing through. Uh, beautiful. 
and our ancestors would have felt that same breeze blowing on them. You know, the birds calling in the distance and the faint noise coming there from the water falling down the, the waterfall and running down through the valley and eroding this away. So it's that, that feel of being somewhere special and knowing that you can form this relationship with everything in it. The rocks, now they're timeless. To me, the synergy, I think, comes from a reinforcement of the specialness of this place that Ron has just talked about. Um, as, we, as we explore this country from a scientific perspective, it's just full of tremendous surprises. Um, there are very few places on Earth where you can sit on rocks as old and ancient as this, with plants as old and uh, with such a deep ancestry, untrammeled by the usual things that scrape landscapes clean. And here we are for our few fleeting moments, but we can still create a continuity of knowledge that's accumulated and then passed on over generations for eons. And uh, that gives you that, that sense of belonging to something and being part of it and it being part of you. I draw a great inspiration from the Noongar perspective about uh, we are just uh, vessels on a long seamless time scale uh, with responsibilities to ancest ancestors and going forward. We have responsibility and I think that's one of the big lessons that um, in big city culture, western culture now, often gets lost, that individuals can hide in the an anonymity of cities and not know that they're, whether they consciously understand or not, they are responsible for, uh, for living, for breathing, for caring. Mass movement across the continent, known as the dispersal period, when people rapidly occupied Western Australia. Noongar populate their country, their Buja, and conform to their law, their Kundan. Threats to survival come from changing environments. To survive, Noongar observe, remember, and communicate across generations. From the scientific perspective, I think long-lasting cultures very clearly demonstrate that humans can see through significant change. And the Nyungar story uh, exem exemplifies that really well. Uh, just behind us and w as we go down the river and end up at its mouth, uh, the big story down there is, is uh, tremendous human adaptation because of uh, over the last 50,000 years, we've gone from an interglacial period in terms of glaciers in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, we're in interglacial conditions right now. And then the last glaciation that covered large areas of the Northern Hemisphere and the Australian Alps and a little bit in Tasmania, uh, that reached its peak about 20,000 years ago. And that's one of the things that Aboriginal people did was adapted to the new situation and knowing that the impact of the new situation would be great on the community. There are other factors, of course, such as your normal um, six season cycle that changes and varies. And we need to adapt. And I think adaptation is a good word to be able to use for that. Um, and that brings about change. And so if you're a coastal people, like the Wajaks, <laughs> uh, new lands was appearing before your eyes out, out yep. beyond there. This land here on the scarp 
was as, as it had always been. Fifty thousand years ago, a sustainable population formed. A hunter-gatherer lifestyle established across the lands and on the coastlines. Sophisticated family and totem systems are given to the Noongar, who develop a rich, sustainable relationship with the land. Knitting stories form the law for social and moral order and establish cultural patterns and customs forevermore. Our ancient way is based on, obviously, stories and that remarkable line about Mrs. Boss, if you've got no story, you've got nothing, is very applicable. And because of that story, wh where does it come from? Bringing the language into it, uh, bringing the cultural component as people live on the land, as they traverse the land, and everywhere you go, you see a story that you can be told anywhere you see it physically. And as you see it physically, then of course, that brings you to a point where you as a person begin to understand it. I think um, Noel has articulated beautifully um, the, the power of understanding landscape. Um, from, a, from a Noongar perspective. I think all, all people have, to some degree, similar experiences. And I, I, as a scientist, do. You can't be but moved, I think, coming to a place like this and just it absorbing you. <laughs> um, but as a scientist, I'm trained uh, uh, subconsciously. Uh, yes, you can absorb all that sort of stuff. But uh, uh, Western Cartesian philosophy is about seeing objects not signs, as Noel was talking about. So I, I really think um, uh, Western ecologists, Western evolutionary biologists can draw from the, the strength and insight of, of people who understand country from uh, an Aboriginal perspective. Another cold time. 22,000 years ago, the last glacial period. It is extremely cold and dry, and the human population dwindles. Noongar adapt by developing fire and farming techniques. Oral histories concern loss of fire and a constant struggle with the unforgiving environment. Sea levels are lower than present, extending coastal plains up to 100 kilometres. The law sets down the need for the well-being of the tribe and not of the individual. As we move across the land and find our way to different areas, travelling the song lines, the great walk trails, the campsites, we're shedding our skin, we're shedding our hair. And as it falls, what happens is it's taken into the ground by all the little insects, ants, microscopic biota, etc. And we call those trees quell. So if I introduced myself to you in language, I'd say Nganj Quell Kada, which means my name is Kada the Goanna. Mm -hmm. Quell is the tree of names. So it knows every person that's ever lived and inhabited this area through the DNA of that skin and the hair. For the hair to be there, 
it has to be fire to burn it into an ash, which then goes into the root systems of the plant. So we're talking about every plant, animal, bird has our DNA in it because they eat and interact in this environment. So those trees are just so important in the overall equation. And here they are, standing here whispering as the wind blows through their leaves. With this hustle and bustle of the city, an aircraft flying past. Life just goes on. So to me, the river really is the connector. And uh, even if you are striking big deals in a high city office, um, taking decisions that have global impact, you are still connected to, to this land. I think between the river and King's Park, uh, Perth is enormously blessed with this juxtaposition of uh, the land, the plants and animals, the culture, uh, and uh, everything that 21st century offers, including developing new buildings. It's a synergy of ancient, ancient, ancient way with this modern, new way. And it's just awesome. And then there, Kings Park or Kart, um, Kartagara, a lot of people call it, is the largest piece of natural vegetation in a city in the Southern Hemisphere. Just incredible. While they're doing billion dollar deals in here, for mining, etc. They're sitting for us and everybody is this unbelievable piece of land and it's got everything in it. The big flood the beginning of the modern warming, with glaciers melting and sea levels rising rapidly. The spirit ancestors, Kada, the Goanna, and Ningan, the Echidna, emerge to take care of all the spirits who were buried in the area that will be flooded. About 7,000 years ago, Australia forms its current shape after much of the land is submerged underwater. Noongar lose nearly a third of their budja, their territory. This modern city of Perth is extraordinary. One of the uh, richest endowed cities on the planet in terms of plants, animals and culture. Uh, and that story is just waiting to be told. Uh, 20,000 years ago, uh, if you reflect also the sea level changes that were going on, just out past Rottnest there is a thing called the Perth Canyon that starts at about 70 metres below sea level and plummets down over the continental shelf and forms a canyon as big as today's Grand Canyon is. You say the sea level has risen and fallen and risen and fallen. I understand it's risen quite uh, some distance lately. I don't know how many years, but um, as a result of that, our stories that are passed down over time talk about a time when you, you could get, walk right out there. I don't know how far, another 20 odd k's. Could you? To Rottnest and beyond? Yep. Really? And uh, I believe that could have been as recent as 7,000 years ago. That's so uh, yeah. the sea level has gone up and down. And it's gone up and down and yep. with each, um, with each uh, major glaciation period yep. in the Northern Hemisphere, Eastern Australia, the water was tied up in glaciers, so the sea level dropped. And then as the glaciers melted, the sea level rose. And quite a, amazing rates. The last glacial maximum was 20,000 years ago. And as the glaciers melted, 
the, the sea was rising two metres every century, and on this continental shelf we've got, that equates at the fastest to 40 metres of land disappearing each year. And that's why in our stories the river used to flow that way once, and now uh, then it's flowed out this way, north of where the island is, yes. and there's that big trench out there, and then of course there's where it flows now. And we began our journey up the other end there, at the beginning of this Swan River or the Devil Yarragon. Yes. And now we've made our way all the way to here to where it finishes. It's the end of our journey. Been beautiful. Been a real pleasure. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Obviously, uh, when you look at this as being a classroom, out here there's just so much to learn about. It's endless. And coming from the base of stories, uh, stories of country, how things came to be, how the birds, the animals, the plants, the trees, everything in nature had a role to play. It's just a great classroom, you know, no walls. If there is, then they're the trees. No ceiling, and if there is, it's the clouds. It's endless. 